Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry, St. John's Episcopal Church, Richmond, Virginia, March 23rd, 1775. Here on 23 March 1775, Patrick Henry delivered his liberty or death speech, calling for American independence during the Second Virginia Revolutionary Convention that included as members George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Peyton Randolph, and Richard Henry Lee. St. John's Church was built in 1741 by Richard Randolph on property donated by Richard's founder, William Byrd II. It continues to serve Enrico Parish, founded in 1611. Buried in its churchyard are George Wythe and Elizabeth Arnold Poe, mother of Edgar Allan Poe. Mr. President, no man thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism as well as abilities of the very worthy gentlemen who have just addressed the house. But different men often see the same subject in different lights. And therefore, I hope it would not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if, entertaining as I do opinions of a character very opposite to theirs, I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the house is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery, and in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offense, I shall consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country, and an act of disloyalty towards the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth, and listen to the song of that siren till she transform us into beasts. It is this part of the wise man engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to the number of those who, having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not, the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cause, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British Ministry for the past ten years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the House. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It will prove to be a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourself how this gracious reception of our petition comports with these warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary for a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the less arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us to submission? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir. She has none. They are meant for us. They could be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British Ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the past ten years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing! 
We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has all been in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find which have not been already exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming in. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne, and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted, our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult, our supplications have been dis disregarded, and we have been spurned with content from the foot of the throne. In vain, after these things, may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve and violate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, and we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained. We must fight! I repeat it, sir, we must fight and appeal to arms and to the God of hosts. It is all that is left us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week? The next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed, and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope till our enemies have bound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature have placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destiny of nations who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were to base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard from the plains of Boston. War is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat it, sir, let it come. It is vain, sir, to extenuate the manner. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale the sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What will they have? If is life so dear, our peace so sweet, has to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God! I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me 